It is the top of the hour. Welcome to Getting to Wow in Photography. I'm Darlene. Um, this is my very first webinar, so I hope you enjoy. Um, there may be a few bumps along the way uh, as this is my first time doing this, so bear with us and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll smooth the bumps over and we'll get you some great information. And by the end of the evening, you will have some uh, practice exercises to take home and things to take away and practice to do your photography. First thing I'd like to do is just introduce the system a little bit. For those of you that have never used GoToWebinar before, there should be a control panel on your screen, uh, usually, usually on the upper right. If it is not showing, look for the little orange arrow and open it up. And you will see several different panels. You can ask a question in the chat panel. And I have Rob, who is moderating for us today. Say hello, Rob. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Hi, Rob. So he's going to he's going to tabulate all the questions, and uh, when it gets to the point where we're going to answer some questions, he's going to give me the most popular ones um, that have been asked, and hopefully we'll get to all of them. So hang on for that portion. So just to test that, if everybody could just go to the chat window and type in for us where you're joining us from. Type in your your city, your country. We'd like to know where where you are all from. And read them out for us, Rob, if you've got some coming in. Nebraska, cool. Sydney, Australia, somebody in Edmonton, Pennsylvania, Lacombe, Charlottesville, North Carolina. I think we drove through there. Nice. Connecticut, Connecticut Naperville, Illinois. Let's see if we can get. Oh, here's uh, New Zealand. Cool. Oppo. Welcome, mate. A lot, of, a lot of people from Connecticut, actually. I'm quite versed in Kiwi speak. Awesome. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for um, participating in that. There's also another section that we're going to do as part of the webinar. A couple of times I'm going to ask you a question. It's called a poll. So that just helps me um, to get to know you a little bit better. So I ask a question. When it pops up, you answer it. So we're going to try that now. I'm going to launch the first one. You should see it on your screen in front of you. Just hit the answer that's applicable for you and submit it. And it will give us an idea of who is watching the program. Wow, you guys are quick. I see a whole bunch of answering, lots of DSLRs. Perfect. So you'll see that window come up um, a few times during the webinar, and that's just, like I said, to give me a better idea of who the audience is and who um, is watching so I know what to do for content for future webinars. Okay, thanks for answering that. And there's one more thing that you may see along the side panel. There's a little hand, and that's to raise your hand. Um, that would just be for something if I'm going to get a quick poll, such as, um, you know, yes or no kind of thing. And if you click it, it just raises your hand, and we can see who clicks your hand. So go ahead and click raise your hand now. And we can see who is raising their hand. Awesome. Okay, if you can't find it, type it into the chat and Rob will try and help how, try and solve that for you. So without any I further, um, oh, sorry, you can answer the question for them. Okay, so I'm going to put your hands down and without any further ado, we're going to get right into the content. So the way that we're going to do this is I'm going to go through it um, and then at the end, we're going to answer at each section, I'm going to try and answer one or two questions. And then at the very end, we're going to do Q&A. So if you have a question as we go through, um, there's three sections. If you have a question about anything as I'm speaking, type it into the chat, and Rob's going to compile those for me, and I'm going to try and answer one or two questions um, per section. Okay? Okay. So it looks like we have reached our maximum of 100. Thanks for joining, everybody. You are the lucky 100 that got in. Okay, so I'll just share the results of the poll with you on that so you can see who all is on the on the webinar tonight. Okay, so for those of you that aren't familiar with me, uh, my name is Darlene Hildebrandt. I've been a photographer for about 25 years. So I've been doing this a really long time. Um, I claim that I've photographed everything from soup to hay because I really have. I've done food photography, portraits, weddings, um, you name it. I've had a full-time studio. I've worked in a commercial studio. Um, after I left my, my studio and my ex-partner, I've done travel photography. Uh, currently, I do a, a bit of fine art. I have my work up in a gallery, and um, mostly now I'm teaching. The last couple of years, I started teaching, and it's something that I really, really enjoy. So uh, I teach local classes, and 
as I mentioned, this is my first webinar. So something that I'm going to be doing more of in the future is this type of thing, which is an online class, um, interactive and being able to reach more people and help you with your photography. That brings me a great amount of joy. So that's me. That's my website. If you've managed to find this webinar somewhere else from a friend that you can find out more information about me and some great articles over on the site. Okay, so the whole point of our webinar today is to help you get some more wow in your photos. I hear from my readers and from some of my students that uh, post their photos online and they don't get the response that they want. You know, maybe they, they get a few people liking their photo or they get a couple of comments, but they don't have anybody saying, wow, that's amazing. And they would like to have more wow comments. So we're gonna try and go today from from looking at some photos that maybe not so wow, blah, and trying to figure out some of the elements that are gonna make more of a wow, okay? So there are th as I mentioned, there's three sections we're gonna talk about today, okay? The three factors. There's a lot more than that, but we're gonna simplify because we only have an hour together, okay? So the first thing we're gonna look at is talking about the background in your picture. We're gonna talk about simplifying, okay? I love the KISS principle. And we're going to talk about differentiate, okay? So being different, how can you do it differently, okay? Number one, watching the background. So a lot of times when we're new to photography, what happens is I see people focus on the subject, okay? And they forget what's in the background and they forget to look at the elements that are behind the subject, okay? And a lot of times the background is just important to make or break the photo as the subject itself. So let's look at the first one, okay? So as I mentioned, we're gonna go from not so much wow, okay? So this one, not so much, okay? This is a photo of a little tree I found in Hawaii that I thought was interesting. Um, what's happening here is the background is way overpowering, okay? It's taking too much attention and you almost don't even see the little tree branch, okay? Let's take a look at um, how we can analyze this. The first thing that I suggest is that you look at your picture upside down. So whether you physically turn your camera upside down and look at it, or if it's on your computer, rotate it so that you're looking at it upside down. What that does is it tricks your brain. And so instead of looking at, you know it's a tree and you know which way it's supposed to be and you know what the subject is, now you're looking at it just for the graphical elements that are in the picture. This is an old trick from when I used to do photographic retouching with, with brushes so tiny that I actually made myself, you know, have to wear glasses because I did such fine work, but I would look at my pictures upside down and see where the bright areas were and I knew what I needed to retouch, okay? So first thing you want to do is look at it upside down. If you see something like this where you all you'd look at is the background, we know that we can do a little better, right? So upon a second try, this is what I came up with. Okay, notice now it's a lot better. You look at the tree, there's more focus for the viewer to go where we want to look, which is those little buds, little flowers on the ends of the tree. The background basically disappears, okay? So we're gonna look at how we can do that, okay? There are four elements in your pictures that in the background, but in a picture in generally, that will take attention. So when you look at an image, you look at the bright things first, as we've seen in the previous image. So what is the brightest always will take your attention, okay? And when you do the upside down trick, that's a good way of seeing immediately where your eye goes, right? Okay, bright colors, especially warm colors, things like yellow, orange, and red, um, pink to some degree, but anything that is a warm color is what calls it, it, it um, projects. So it comes out of the picture towards you. And if you have those colors in your background, so let's say you have somebody walk by in a red jacket, just as you take the picture, they're gonna grab your attention, okay? Contrast. Very similar to brightness, because usually when you have a bright area, you also have a dark area. So you have highlights, areas of great brightness, and you have shadows, areas of great darkness, side by side, and it creates a lot of contrast that also draws the eye, right? And lastly, sharpness. So the thing that is in focus, the thing that is actually the tack sharpest is going to draw your attention when you look at a picture. So if everything in the picture is in focus and is sharp, 
you're you're not going to know where to look. The eye is confused. Okay. We have to keep in mind that as photographers, we're dealing with a two-dimensional medium trying to represent a three-dimensional subject. So we have to present that in a way that our viewer, who wasn't there when we took the picture, is going to get the subject in a way that we saw it. Okay. So how can we control the background? Okay. Lens selection is one. We'll look at each of these in more detail. The angle of view. Okay and your camera settings. Okay, so the first one, lens selection. Um, if you have a wide lens, you're going to see an angle of view that is very wide, okay? So what that means is imagine uh, a horse and buggy, okay? So when you see a horse and buggy, they have these funny little blinders on the horse. And what that does is it makes the horse focus and, and look straight ahead so that the horse doesn't wander off to the side okay so i'm going to make you guys do all this so imagine with me that you are the horse put your hands up to your your face like this and if people are in the room with you they're going to think you're crazy but we don't care this is all in the name of learning so if you are the horse and you have your hands like this your your the blinders are wide open so that's like your wide angle lens and you could see with the wide angle lens depending on how wide it is out to your peripheral vision so way out to the sides as you close your hands down and you make tunnel vision like this and the horse's blinders are closed, that's more replicating what you would see with a long lens or a telephoto. So you see much less of the background, okay? And that's apparent in the two pictures here. So the one on the left was taken with a very wide lens on my camera. It's a 17 millimeter. I have a, a, a full frame camera. If you're using a crop sensor camera, such as a Canon Rebel or a Nikon D7000 or something that has a crop sensor, that's going to be equal to about a 12 millimeter lens. Okay. So if you have something that's really wide, you're going to see a lot of background, right? When you look at that compared to the one on the right, you see very little background and it also looks like it's a lot more out of focus. Okay, so now for those of you that know a little bit about aperture, you would think that the one on the right is using a much larger aperture to get that background out of focus. However, it's a trick of optics. They're both done at the same aperture and she is at the same distance to the house. Okay, so she has not moved. The only thing I have changed is my lens. So how your background appears in your picture has a lot to do with the focal length of the lens that you choose. Okay. Second one, controlling your background, is your angle of view. Notice in the picture on the left, um, we have a lot of stuff going on in this picture. So all the elements that I talked about that take your attention, the brightness, okay? we have bright sky, the contrast, we have contrast between that dark tree and the bright sky, bright colors, we have bright colored yellows and greens in the trees on the right. Okay? The only thing sharp is the fountain, but do you even see it in all of that mess? Okay? Let's take a look at the picture on the right. It's a simplified version. So basically, I've just walked around the fountain 180 degrees. So I've changed my background by changing my angle of view using my feet. Okay. So I walked around it. Now I'm seeing this building in the background. Okay. This is in Hawaii. It's better, right? We have a simpler background. There's less going on, but we still have this bright, bright building. Okay. So it's better, but can we, can we do better yet? Now in the final image of the fountain, this is the same fountain. I've used the combination of the lens choice and my angle of view. So I've walked around the fountain to discover which side is gonna give me the simplest background that's not bright. I've come into a long lens with the zoom on, zoom right in on the detail of the fountain to get down into just the fountain itself and eliminate most of the background, okay? So all of these elements that I'm giving you work together and it's not usually one, but many of them that are going to apply, okay? Okay, the third option that I talked about for controlling your background is camera settings, okay? Uh, mentioned aperture earlier and how it controls your depth of field, okay? So depth of field, if you're not familiar with that term, just means how deep does your focus go? So if I focused on this tree up in the front of my picture, the focus goes a long ways into the picture because I'm using F22. Okay, so F22 is a very small opening on your lens, right? but it gives you a lot of depth of field. Okay? The easy way that I tell my beginner students to remember, uh, because it seems backwards in aperture, um, the number, so F22, if you have a big number, you have big depth of field. Okay? So imagine if you have 22 fence posts, they're all in focus. Right? Whereas if you have F2, imagine you only have two fence posts in focus. So that's how I kind of like to give you a little trick to remember that.
right? Landscape photographers will often use a setting like this because they want a lot of depth of field, right? You don't always want that. So in this picture, you can see pretty much everything that's going on. You can see the tree, you can see our deck in the background, and you can even see an RV parked in our driveway. So I'm going to go down in the aperture, um, and as I change the number, you'll see the aperture is going to open, okay? So I go to the next one, which is F16, so it's getting to be a bigger opening. Okay, I'm keeping the exposure the same because I'm adjusting my shutter speed in the opposite direction. So notice as I open up the aperture and I'm going to go all the way down to f1.8. Okay, this was done with my 85 millimeter f1.8 lens. Now, if you don't have a lens that goes to 1.8, go as far as you can. Right. And what I would highly suggest is if you do not already have one, I love, love, love a little lens called my Nifty 50. Okay, it's a 50 mil f1.8, uh, whether you're Canon or Nikon or Pentax or Olympus, they probably have a similar version for, for your camera, okay? Um, and what it allows you to do is it gets you a lens that's very inexpensive. The Canon one is about $125. I think the Nikon one is about $200. The others are probably in a similar price range. They're small, lightweight, and it's a great lens to have in your bag, okay? for this reason. So let's take a look at the two compared. So we have F22 for maximum depth of field on the left, and you see how that changes the background versus F1.8, right? So I focused on the tree in both pictures. On the picture on the right, you can barely even tell what is in the background. You can't tell whether it's it's dirt or snow. Um, you don't know what, the, what it is, okay? So it really is obscuring the background and forcing you to look at that tree that is in focus. All right, so that is coming to the end of the first section. Um, we're going to do another poll, and we're going to take a question from the audience if Rob has a question for us. So if you could answer this next poll that is now up on your screen while we get the question from Rob. Rob, do you have a question for us? Yeah. Um, the only real question here is from Richard Kerr, who's asking, I have, Hi, a, Nikon, I have a Nikon Coolpix P520, which I like but I don't know how to add a lens. Is it possible? I believe that the camera that you have is not a one that has a removable lens. Um, the Coolpix line are generally ones with, with a lens that's attached. So it's more of a um, what would be considered a point and shoot or a bridge camera. If you want to get into one that has a lens that removes, you need to move up to either an SLR or you might want to look at what's becoming really popular these days is the four thirds cameras, micro four thirds, such as a Sony NEX, or if you're in the Nikon line, the Nikon V or the J line, if you want to stay with Nikon, um, all of those ones in that line, uh, I am coveting right now the Olympus OMD. They have removable lenses and a lot of benefits of the SLRs, which are bigger, but they come with a smaller size. So you might want to take a look at those. Thanks for the question, Richard. Uh, I'm going to close the poll. Keep switching me out as soon as I do that. Okay, so our second element then um, is going to be to simplify. So our first point was we're going to look for our backgrounds. Okay? Our second is we're going to simplify. So we're going to take a look at the KISS principle a little bit closer. Okay? So this is something I talk about a lot in my classes. Um, if, if Len is listening, I know you're on the line there. You've been to my travel class, so he's probably seen this one. Um, this is a process. So photography is not a destination. It is a journey. Um, and it's a process of getting to the final image. Okay. So simplification, uh, I will talk a lot about getting closer. So simplification means including less in your picture. And this is a great example to use because take a look at how many actual headstones are in this picture. This is a little cemetery in Savannah that's quite famous because it's, it's got this beautiful trees and garden, um, but it's also in this picture very busy, right? So if we're looking at what we learned in the first part, the background, there's lots of bright colors and contrast taking our eye away, okay? So this was done with an 80 mil lens, just to give you a perspective. We're gonna take a look at the next version. So I zoomed in a little bit to know, notice how many headstones there are in this picture, okay? Just to give you an idea, I'll go back to the previous one, okay? How fast can you count versus this one, okay? So there's physically less included in the picture because I've done that thing with the blinders. I'm looking with a longer lens, okay? So that's number one sim simplification, right? 
Now I've zoomed in even more and I've done a change of my focus. So rather than focusing on the front element, I'm actually focusing on a row behind. Okay, so it makes me sort of have a foreground that's out of focus and a background that's out of focus. And you can see that the depth of field is just the narrow strip down the middle. Okay, so it's better, right? We're getting somewhere. And now I probably went through about eight different shots before I came to this final one, um, shot with about 130 millimeters. And what attracted me was the little flag at the bottom. This is a veteran section of the cemetery. And so the little flag being there attracted me and it had meaning, you know, as a, as a veteran. And the little white flowers. So to me, there was a lot of symbolism going on there about, about you know, death and new life with the flowers. And you don't have to necessarily, you know, think about those things when you're photographing, but start to notice things like that. Start to notice little details. And by getting in closer, that's where they're going to find those things, right? If I stayed with my wide shot that I originally had, I wouldn't have noticed the little flowers. Okay. Is it the best shot of the series? That's debatable because the thing about photography is it's all subjective. So the picture that I like might not be the picture that you like. Okay. And that's per perfectly okay. Okay. But the idea with simplification is that getting closer and closer so that you can see some of those little details that maybe you, you've passed up before. Okay. Okay. So I hear a lot from my students about they want to go from uh, a point where they have 90% of their pictures go in the trash and 10% are keepers, and they want to try and reverse that. Um, I'm here to tell you that that's not going to happen. And how, like I said, it's a process. Photography is a process and it's a destination journey to get there. So you need to take those 90 pictures to be able to get the 10 good ones, okay? So I will take six or eight or 10 pictures to be able to get to the final one. Let's take a look at another example. Okay, so this is from a recent trip that uh, we did to Oregon, okay? So I got to the location, there's a beautiful stream, there's a waterfall up top, I plunked my tripod down, um, that's how I'm getting the nice misty waterfall scene, okay? And it's okay, I would call it eh, just okay, okay? So I moved in a little closer. Physically, I moved over to the stream so that now one of my tripod legs is actually in the water. Um, I have been known to stand in the water myself, right? So rubber boots are, are handy to have with your camera kit. Okay? Notice now that you can see more of the stream to the left and the waterfall up in the top left-hand corner. How I'm getting the long, um, the nice misty water. If you want to know more about that, I actually have an article on my website from uh, a couple weeks ago on how to photograph waterfalls. You can find that under the tips section. Okay, so my third shot, now I'm trying to, this is what I call working the scene. So I'm looking at what can I do that changes it up a little bit. So I wanted to capture the water sort of rippling over the rocks. I like sort of the, the, the contrast of the flowing water and the rocks. To me, this one is not working though, because your eye reads left to right and the stream is just zipping you right out, right? There's nothing there to keep your interest. So I try again. So now this is my fourth shot. Notice the simplification. So I'm getting in closer every time. Every time I move my camera in a little bit, maybe I'm zooming in, I'm changing it to take less of the scene in and get closer to what I'm actually getting to as the subject matter, okay? So keep in mind that your subject may not be waterfall right and what you'll see in a moment is it's actually not right so this is my fifth shot and we're getting really close now and this is getting to the meat of the, of the matter where for me the subject here is actually a difference in texture so the texture of the rocks with the water and the moss to the flowing soft water right and to me that's what i wanted to capture i wasn't completely happy with this composition so i changed it one more time and i came up with this one okay and by getting in closer, you see what else that I noticed that I didn't notice when I was shooting the wider shots was that little leaf on the rock, right? So I didn't put the leaf there. It's not beyond me doing such a thing. I would do that, but it was there. And I wouldn't have noticed it if I hadn't come in closer and looked closer at the details and I wouldn't have seen that beautiful moss with the texture, right? So it's an evolution, right? So the lesson here for this section is saying, saying more you need to include less oftentimes, okay? So you don't need to say the whole thing. Um, think about it in terms of, of speaking, right? Sometimes you don't need to say six paragraphs that you can say in one sentence, okay? So lessons more, simplify, okay? Kiss principle, keep it simple, silly, right? Limit the viewer's options. So know where you want the viewer's eye to go 
and limit what they see. So think about terms of omitting certain things, okay, rather than including. What do you not need in the picture? Okay, okay we come to the end of the second section, Rob. We, uh, oh, there's the answer to the last poll. Do we have any questions on this section? Yeah, I've actually got quite a few. Um, a common one, I would say, are from Lorraine Kessel and Somaya Schnur regarding um, where do you stand on editing in Photoshop versus just in camera? How much editing is too much? And do you make pictures thinking at the same time about how much easier post-processing could make your final intent or not at all? So I think the question really is about, and I know the answer to this because I know you, um, <laughs> I'll, I'll just let you answer. Okay, uh, Rob's gonna answer for me. Um, okay, so that's a really great question and I, I do get asked that a lot. I do post-process my photos. I don't over-process them, uh, particularly portraits. In a scene like the one we just saw with the waterfall, most of my processing is done in Lightroom. Um, that's my program of choice and I probably do 95% of what I do in Lightroom. I, I would say I spent no more than two minutes processing each of those images, right? So things that I would do in there would be um, correct the exposure if it's a little darker light, boost up the contrast a little bit, maybe add some clarity, which punches the, the um, relative contrast a little bit, and maybe punch the colors, right? Other than that, I'm not doing a whole lot more, okay? Does that answer like your to, question? I'd like to have one more question answered if I could. A uh, quick one. Uh, getting closer, does that mean you have to have a different lens handy to switch to? Um, you know, it helps, but one of the things that I also talk about is that you can zoom with your feet too. So getting closer also means physically closer, right? So just getting physically closer allowed me to see that leaf on the rock. Okay. Right, moving on. So thanks for doing that poll. Oh, there's the answer if everybody wants to see that one. Okay. Okay, so the next one and our last tip for today uh, in making more wow photos is to dare to be different, okay? And this applies pretty much to anything in life, you know, a standing out from the crowd is always you want to be different, okay? How we can do that is by changing your lens changing your angle of view, changing the lighting, if you have control over that, but adding some movement. So we talked about depth of field before, we're gonna talk a little bit about movement, okay? Um, you'll see, saw that in the waterfall picture, the movement is actually happening with the water itself. If you don't have control of the lighting, um, you, you may see a change just by changing your angle of view. Okay? So let's take a look at some examples of how we can do this. Right. So here's a typical game farm type of situation. We visit the game farm. They have little pellets out to feed the deer. And of course, they come running because they want to be fed. So this is done with, you know, an average middle sort of middle of the road lens, probably with my 80 or 100. Right? Folk shot, shot straight on at their level. Right? Pretty standard. Right? How can we do it differently? So this is what I came up with. So now I'm using a super wide lens, which gives a couple of different things. It changes the perspective. So anything that's close to the lens looks really big. Okay, so their heads look extremely elongated and large, almost cartoon-like, and their bodies look small. That applies when you're photographing people too. So when you're photographing people with a wide lens, keep that in mind, because if you're doing that to your spouse, they're probably not gonna like that so much, okay? Um, if you want to add some humor, then definitely a wide lens like this is the way to go. Okay? And I'm also taking a higher camera angle, so I'm looking down on them. Okay? This was a tricky shot to take because I have kibbles for the deer in one hand, and I'm trying to take the shot with the other hand and frame it and get it all in focus at the same time. Okay? So trying to change it up a little bit, and yes, they did get their, they did get their kibbles. Okay, so this is a festival, okay? So something that a lot of people will attend in the summer. This was an outdoor festival that I was asked to photograph. I did it as a volunteer for them. Um, it's a Latin festival. So these are tango dancers, okay? So this is a pretty standard shot. You probably see stuff like this on Facebook. People go to a festival, they see this kind of thing, okay? Um, if you're in Edmonton, you know, this is Churchill Square, right? Pretty standard. So how can we change it up? So I forced myself in this situation um, to think more in terms of what is tango all about? I don't know a lot about it, but I know it's about the footwork, right? So I wanted to simplify, I wanted to get rid of the background, and I wanted to do something different. So this is what I came up with. 
right? So in this image, which was highly preferred by the dancers and the people that run the festival over the other one, because this one to them really speaks of the footwork and the intricacy and the, how engaged the two dancers are with each other than the other one does, okay? We still see that there's an audience in the background. Um, they're blurred out, so they don't take your attention so much. And I've eliminated as much of the contrast as possible. So where you go is definitely to their feet. So a little bit different approach. Generally, I'm going to do both. Okay, So I'm going to do the standard picture that looks like this. And then I'm going to do something different. Okay, Especially if I'm doing a picture for somebody or for an event such as this, I'm going to do the standard stuff. And then I'm going to play. Right. And most of the time I find that people like the ones that I've played around with a lot more okay, because they speak to them. They have more of a story. This one definitely has a story. Um, this is a fellow in New Orleans. He gives tours with his horse and buggy. So there's your horse with the blinders. Okay? Um, a lady walked by and I was just chatting with this fellow. He's an interesting guy. And I was asking him about, you know, the hurricane and living in New Orleans after the fact and how it's what life is like there. And a lady walked by and the horse nudged the lady on, on the behind with, with the horse's nose. And so the guy went to the horse and he's like, naughty, 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 you are a bad, bad girl. And the horse kind of hung her head, you know, she in shame. And then he says to her, give me a kiss. And he pointed to her cheek and this is what happened. Um, so a lot of what happens in photography, and I say this over and over again, is being in the right place at the right time with the right lens on. And that's exactly what happened here, right? If I hadn't have been there talking to him, I would have missed the shot. If I hadn't been ready and had a wide angle lens on, I wouldn't have got this exact shot. And if it hadn't have been a wide angle lens, it wouldn't look as funny as it does, right? And I love the humor of this picture. Right, let's look at it in sort of a standard landscape type of image, okay? This is the prairie. For those of you that live on the prairies, pretty standard, right? Flat. Um, if you have grain elevators where you live, they're a dying breed here in Alberta. So there's not very many of them left. And when you see one, generally I want to photograph it. Okay, so I've got all the elements working here. Composition is working. We've got rule of thirds. The horizon is, you know, on the third. Um, we've got a good exposure. The clouds are nice and fluffy. We've got nice colors. But to me, it was just, it was boring. It's average. So I wanted to see what else I could do to make it a little bit different. Okay? So I changed up my angle of view. So the lens I'm using is slightly wider, but not much. And I got down lower so that I'm actually using the barbed wire fence to frame the grain elevator through the wires. Okay. Another thing I'm using is a tilt. Okay. I tend to tilt a lot. It's part of my style. Um, and a general rule of thumb that I give is that if your horizon is tilted, say, 5 or 10 degrees, that's crooked. Okay, that looks like a mistake. It looks like you need to fix it. Whereas if you're tilted 30 degrees or 45 degrees, that's on purpose. Okay, um, diagonal lines. And when you're tilting like that, notice the fence has diagonal lines and the horizon is diagonal line going the other way. Diagonal lines have a lot more dynamic feel than straight lines. They feel more static. Okay, so try some tilting. That's another way to add drama and add some something different. One more thing with the grain elevator, I liked sort of the juxtaposition of the highly textured grain elevator in the old wood with the soft fluffy clouds and the blue sky. So I wanted to just get in close. So now I have three different pictures of the grain elevator. Again, none is right or wrong, they're just different. And it's an evolution of the scene. And I wouldn't come to the end, which is this one, if I hadn't come through all the preceding steps. Okay, so don't be afraid of taking 90 pictures to get 10. Okay. Most photographers, um, I talked with a photographer, uh, friends that I know um, the other day, and they said their goal for the year, okay, now keep in mind, this is a professional photographer, is to have 10 amazing pictures for the year, okay? So keep that in perspective. You know, if you're, if you're doing 10 out of 100, you're doing pretty well, pat yourself on the back. One more way to differentiate, we talked about lighting a little bit. Okay, so here's a, a, a fun old guy we found at a Western town in Arizona that we visited. So it's a setup mock Western town and these guys dress in character and they role play, uh, you know, a, a shoot 'em up in the, mid, in the middle of the town. So he's a character actor. Um, he didn't know I was taking this photo. Now this is a nice portrait of him. I, I really enjoy this. I wanted something different. So I'm very observant about where the light is coming from. So you'll notice the light is coming from the front of his face. So I walked around him, behind him, changed my lens, and ended up with this picture. 
Okay, so he's standing in exactly the same spot, taken with a different lens. Now, of course, I changed it to black and white, made it sepia, which gives it that old feel, right? Enhanced the contrast, and that's part of that processing that you asked about. I did increase the contrast here because I wanted it to be almost a pure silhouette of black and just white. Okay, so how I differentiated that is angle of view. I moved around him, changed my lens, and I looked at how the lighting was different. Okay, so what we've seen in the picture of the dancers, you don't need to see their whole body. And in this one, you don't need to see their face. So you don't need to always see everything to still get the story. Okay. One more, um, if any of you are joining us from Asia, this is going to be a very typical scene for you. This is in Malaysia. Lots of scooters. Right? If you live in Asia, there's lots of scooters. This is a pretty standard street corner on any street in Asia. Okay? Wanted to do something a little bit different, so I wanted to incorporate some movement. Okay? So this is a technique called panning, where you actually use a slower shutter speed and move with the object as it goes across your field of view. It takes a little bit of practice. I do have an article on panning and using shutter speed under the tip section in the website as well. Just do a search for that. If you can't find it, email me and I'll send you a link. Okay. So adding motion, things like a, a blur intentionally or blurring of the water with a long shutter speed for something different. Okay. okay, we've come to the end of that section. I'm going to do one more poll. Okay, so how did you find out about this particular webinar and do we have any questions about that section, Rob? Lots of questions. Woohoo! Um, Lots of different ones, and I wish I could answer them all. So pick um, some popular, pick a popular one because I'm going to continue with Q and A after I finish. Um, I'm going to give you guys some homework. So after I finish the homework, um, we're going to talk about continued learning, and I'm going to do a full on Q and A. So if anybody wants to stick around uh, for, I will stay on the webinar as long as you guys want, as long as you have questions. Okay, so I will make sure that everybody has one gets answered. So pick a popular one. Sure. Um... Well, uh, I guess somebody wants to know here about filters. Uh, are filters necessary in photography? Oh, that's a good question. Um, see, you. if you ask me, I'm going to say no, because I don't use them all that often. The only two filters that I personally use are I have UV filters on all my lenses. OK, um, and that's a debatable subject as well. I know I've discussed that in my newsletter previously. Some people use them, some don't. Um, I use them to protect the front of my lenses. I've paid lots of money for most of my lenses, more than $1,000. So for me, a $100 filter protects the front of my lens from scratches and dust, right? Better than losing my $1,000 lens. Uh, the other filter that I've started using a lot more of is a neutral density or an ND filter, okay? And that's how you get the slow moving water. If you're photographing waterfalls in the daytime, I talked a little bit about that on the waterfall um, article on the website recently about using a neutral density filter. All it does is it's like putting sunglasses on, so it darkens everything. So it allows you to use the slower shutter speeds in mid daylight. But other than that, I personally don't use a lot of them. Um, I do HDR photography, which helps me blend exposures if I have bright sky and dark areas. And I find that if you're using Lightroom, especially Lightroom 4 and up, you can pull a whole lot of detail out of a lot of areas that just wasn't possible before, um, before digital or before Lightroom 4, right? So the raw processors, that's another key is shooting raw files, right? So I personally don't use a lot of filters. So it looks like most everybody found, uh, found this from the newsletter, which is awesome. So you guys are reading the newsletter. I'm very excited about that. Okay, so let's do a little summary and recap. What have we learned? Okay, I'm going to recap. I'm going to give you some practice exercises. Where do we go from here, as I said, and our Q&A. Okay, so what have we learned today? The first thing we learned is to look at our background. So take a close look at what is behind your subject and become more familiar with doing that. Okay, so get used to looking at the picture on your back of your camera after you take it. Another good tip is look through the viewfinder of your camera. If you have a camera that has an optical viewfinder like an SLR, use it. Okay, don't use a live view on the back of your camera because what happens is it's like the blinders again with the horse. It's going to force you to look at the elements of the picture and nothing else. And you'll start to see things in the background that you missed before. 
include less, okay? So include less in the image, um, get closer, okay? I say this a lot, I say this a lot, get closer, get closer, get closer. I think I talk about it in um, one of the emails that you guys get if you signed up, and you can hear my voice as you go out and photograph. So if you're out shooting and you can't remember what I said today, just hear, okay, Darlene said, get closer. That's all you take away from today, you'll be one further, one step further. Okay. How can you make it different? Okay, just have that in your head. Um, if you're not sure at this point, if you're new to photography, if you don't have a wide array of lenses to use, think about how else you can make it different. Okay, think about what happens if you only have a 50 mil lens, and I tell people to do this assignment all the time. How can you make a difference just with one lens that's all the same and it doesn't even zoom? Okay, so there's lots of ways that you can do that. Okay, can you put the link for this in the chat, please, Rob? Okay, so this is going to be a PDF that you can download. I'm going to give you three practice exercises that you can take away and go do. Okay, so you can go to the link that Rob is giving in the chat room now to get the PDF or you can get it later. Okay, so practice number one is going to be about the background. So they each relate to the lessons that we did today. Pick a subject that you can go all the way around. Okay, so photograph it from all four directions, right? East, west, north, south, or however you want to call that, okay? Photograph it from all four directions and look at what's happening to the background, okay? Same subject. Then change your lenses. If you have a longer lens, put a longer lens on and do the same exercise with the same subject. So you're going to end up with eight pictures of the same subject and they're all going to be different because of the background, okay? You'll also notice something else change. The lighting will change, okay? Look for things like how the texture changes, especially if you pick like an old tree or if you find something cool like an old uh, junk car in a junkyard or something, okay? Take a look at the images on your picture on your on your screen. Take a look at them on your camera and your computer and please share them. So I've created a private Flickr group for people that are on this webinar to come and share your pictures. So share your exercises. Um, just make sure that when you post them onto the Flickr group and it's flickr.com. If you don't have a, um, a profile already, it's free to join. Please join and, and ask to join the group. So you have to request that you join and just mention when you ask the request to join that you were in the webinar and I will add you to the group and share your pictures, but tell me what exercise they're from, okay? So I'm not guessing. Okay, exercise number two is gonna be part number two in our lesson today, which is simplify. Okay, so find another subject, something that you don't, um, something that you have taken photos of before, perhaps, and try and get closer, so simplify it. A lot of people get into macro photography, which is the ultimate in simplification. Okay, so we'll talk about photographing the very interior of a flower where you just see the petal or the stamen in the flower. A lot of times macro gets so close that it becomes abstract and you don't even know what it is anymore. Okay, so think about getting close and just doing pieces of the same object. Okay, so get closer, 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 go so close that you can't get closer anymore because your lens won't focus anymore. Okay. Once again, share them. Okay. Um, have you provided the link to where to share for them, Rob? That should be in the chat. So it's for herviewphotography.com forward slash wow share. Should be in the chat for you, the link to the Flickr group. Okay, the last exercise is again to be different. So they relate to our three three lessons for today. Find an ordinary object. So something that you would consider boring, garbage can even. Um, something that you pass every day, a stop sign, um, an old shoe, whatever the case might be. Find something that you think is ordinary and boring and make it different, make it look different. Okay, um, if it's something that you can move like an old shoe, put it in different places, put it in different lighting, shine a bright light on it, take it outside, put it in the shade, try different things with it and see what happens. Okay, and keeping in mind the other two lessons as you go. Okay, so you're starting to put together all the pieces of as you look for something different, you're also looking at your background and you're simplifying. Okay, so that is our three practice exercises, and we're going to talk about, uh, I've got one more poll for you guys, this is the last one. So something that I'm gonna be launching, and I'm gonna tell you about the first one right away, is um, four week classes. So it's gonna be basically what we're doing right now, but an extended version of this. So if you could please answer this poll, and um, I'm curious to see what everybody is most interested in taking. These are some subjects that I already do teach classes on, um, and I'm looking at building some classes that we can take virtually together. Okay? 
Do we have any um, questions about the homework, Rob? Uh, both the homework, no. Well, most of the questions regarding the last section, actually. Okay, we'll come back to those. Okay. Uh, I'll give it five more seconds to vote. If you haven't voted, please do so. And we're going to close it. Okay. So if you're curious, that's what everybody said. Awesome. Good cross section of everything. Okay, so moving on, um, as I mentioned, I've actually built the first one of such classes already. So um, I hope that you've enjoyed the information that I've given you tonight. And like I said, it's just the tip of the iceberg. The classes that I teach are generally 12 hours to 18 hours. So it's very hard to teach the whole scope of that in, in a one hour webinar. I wanna give you as much as you can so that you can go practice, but there's a lot more, right? So what I've done is I've designed a four week class, four weeks to better photography. Okay. And in this class, it's going to be interactive like we're doing now, even more so. The maximum in this class is going to be 25. You'll get a chance to speak with me and share your own video feed and see your face if you if you so desire. Um, so then we can chat with each other just like we're in a, in a, in a regular classroom. Okay. There, uh, there will be interaction. The class will be live. So it's not going to be recorded that you watch it. It's going to be live exactly like what I just did with, with the one you just watched. Okay. Maximum is 25. So each week you will have two hours. We're going to have a lesson like we just did. There'll be Q&A and there'll be image review. So every person in the class will have a chance to get feedback on their images. I'll give you feedback on what's working, how, what you can do to improve it, and encouragement. Okay. The one thing I find in my class and I've heard from other students is that they took a class and the instructor ripped apart their pictures and they got discouraged. So that is not something that I do. Um, there's always there's always a good in a picture in something, whether you're, it's just where you're at in your stage of your development, right? So don't compare yourself to anybody else, and that's not what I do. So we look at solely where you are and where you're going and make sure that you're always moving upwards, okay? You'll have weekly assignments, just like we just did with the practice assignments, and they'll be reviewed the following week live in the class. So we'll talk about um, any trouble that you had, and we'll look at the images that everybody created using the same type of idea with the Flickr group. So you'll share your images to the Flickr group, and we'll look at them together and discuss them. Okay? So you'll get PDF of all the handouts. They'll be recorded, just like this one is being recorded. The class starts. Tuesday, September the 10th at 6 p.m., which is the same time we started today, okay? And it runs for four weeks. So it's an eight-hour class, okay? And the regular price on this class is $199 if you'd like to join it, okay? And for those of you that have joined this webinar, I'm going to give you 30 bucks off, okay? So if you would like to join this class and there's absolutely no pressure, right? I'm gonna do another free webinar in the future. You can just join as many free ones as you like. But if you want extended learning, come and join us. The discount code to get $30, $30 off is Octopus. Why Octopus? Why not? We couldn't think of anything better. Okay? So if you're interested in knowing more about that, the website for that, if you could provide the link, please, Rob, is herviewphotography.com forward slash four weeks. Okay? And you have until the end of the week, Friday, if you want to use that discount code to get the $30 off. Okay? And because it's also a brand new class, I'll give you another 30 bucks off. So the whole class will end up being $139 for eight weeks, for eight hours, four weeks, um, if you provide feedback from that class to me. So I take your feedback and I make the class better. So for thank you for providing that feedback, I will give you an additional $30 off if you agree to that. Okay. You'll also have an option if you want to book private tutoring with me um, and get a discount on that as well. Okay. So I've come to the end of that part, and now we're gonna do a full-on Q&A. So let her rip, Rob. What kind of what kind of questions have you got? Awesome, and I hope people are sticking around because I'm feeling really guilty having to choose these, these questions. <laughs> like I said, I will stay here until they are all answered. Okay, so um, the, the webinar is scheduled for seven o'clock. I don't even know what time it is, which is 10 minutes from now. I will stay here until everybody's questions is answered, which is, if it's an hour, I'm still here. So okay. let her let her rip. Okay, so let's go back a bit here. Uh, I answered one. The question was, is do you ever shoot in raw? And I said you always shoot in raw. Um, okay. Uh, any suggestions for using negative space? Prime lenses ah. are also a great way to learn to compose your shots by you moving. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So that's kind of two questions in one. 
Um, negative space is, is great. I mean, look at the slide on the screen. What do you see? A whole bunch of white, right? Um, negative space is great when you use it well because it draws the eye to the other part. Right. Graphic designers use a lot of negative space in, in their design. Um, I mean, this is a PowerPoint slide designed right out of, you know, PowerPoint. I didn't design it. I'm not a designer, but they know what they're doing. So, yes, negative space is absolutely a good use of, of your image. Right. So having your actual subject only take a small portion will actually draw the eye to it. Right. Um, the second part of the question again, Rob, that was about using the 50 mil lens. Oh, I lost it. Lost that one. Um... Yep, sorry, I've moved 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 around here. Sorry, I forgot the second part of it. Okay, next question. Okay. Uh, about bokeh. Does the uh -huh. bokeh matter in the background? Um, so I'm gonna correct Rob's pronunciation of that because he's not a photographer, but that's okay. It's it's actually bokeh. Um, it's a Japanese word which means out of focus stuff in the background. <laughs> a fancy word for out of focus stuff in the background. Um, Creating this bokeh or bokeh or however you want to pronounce it, um, there's a lot to do about you need to have, you know, the fancy big lenses uh, like a 1.2 lens. You notice that I had that with my 1.8 85 mil. You could get the same type of thing with the 50 that I talked about. OK, you can also create that same type of thing with the longer lens. You'll get notice the one where I showed the slide, the wide versus the long. So the longer the lens you have, you'll get more of that out of focus background. OK, so out of focus background comes from three things. Your focal length, okay? the longer it is, the more out of focus it gets. Your aperture, okay? that's only one piece of it. And the third part is how far away is the background. Okay? So if your subject is standing up against a wall that's a foot away, you're never going to get the background out of focus. Okay? So having them 20 feet away from the wall, you're going to get it out of focus. I hope that answers that question. Sounds good. Uh, another question here is um, about uh, photographing a mountain. So you've been talking about getting in closer. Uh, when photographing a mountain far away, therefore getting closer is not an option. How to keep it simple. Okay. From Danielle so, Rocket. Okay. So that could be a different type of situation. So that would be maybe you want to look at differentiation. Okay. Because how many mountain pictures have we all seen? So take a look at, you know, the the really high end landscape photographers and, and what they do and how their pictures look different. A lot of times they're putting something in the foreground. Okay. So they might have a little yellow daisy in the foreground and the mountain is just the background. Okay. Or a field of flowers and the mountain is in the background. Okay. So they're differentiating in terms of it's not just a mountain, it's a mountain and you have the whole scene. Um, so it's a bit more storytelling when you have a foreground and a background. Okay. So I would not necessarily simplify in that case as much as I would differentiate. I hope that helps. Great. I got a general question here that I know you're going to enjoy answering, and then we're going to get technical. Um, okay. Living in a living in a big city could be intimidating to go out on the streets and take pictures. Of uh, what would the uh, uh, things you'd like? So, do you have an opinion or advice about how to go by approaching a subject? Absolutely. And I think you probably know what I'm going to say, Rob. I do. Um, <laughs> find a support group. Okay. So what that means is, yes, it is intimidating, and I've seen that happen a lot. Um, where here in Edmonton, I lead a lot of photo walks and there's a perfect opportunity coming up because on October the 5th, I believe, is the Worldwide Photo Walk. Um, I will type that into the chat room myself, actually. Um, I think there's no W's. Worldwide Photo Walk. And it's put on by Scott Kelby. And you can probably find one in your neighborhood. So it's a perfect time to get out and find one of these groups. If there isn't a one, you can you can apply to lead one if you're so um, inclined. If you can't find a photo walk in your area, look for a photography club. Uh, you can check meetup.com. You can check Flickr. You can check Twitter, Facebook groups. Find a group of photographers that hang out together in your area. Okay? Um, especially if you're in a city, there's probably going to be a group somewhere that maybe you just haven't found. Okay, so there's support in numbers. So when you're going out and photographing on the street, especially it's it's scary photographing people on the street. Right. So when you go out and do it as a group, it's less scary. Right. Okay? Um, one of the first photo walks that I led, uh, I had a lady that was wanted to leave the group, leave the walk after about 15 minutes because she she wasn't sure and she was rather um, unsure. And basically, I helped her. I gave her an assignment. You know, I gave her a focus on on an exercise like what you guys just got, 
and she went about doing it and lo and behold she finished the walk and had a great time so it's you know i'm a more experienced photographer i'm in a more experienced walker find a group that has different experience levels because you don't necessarily need a teacher or a class you just need somebody to to you know to hold your hand literally or figuratively and take you along okay so that. uh sure some some uh technical questions do you ever All right. oh no that's the wrong one um oh shoot oh do you dodge and burn during your post-processing <laughs> from, from aha Griffin? Who's this from? Frank Griffin. Great. Frank, look, type in the chat for us. Did you have you ever shoot, shot film? Because you sound like a film shooter to me. Because them them's film terms. Um, yes, I do dodge and burn, and I do it mostly in Lightroom using the adjustment brush. Like I said, most of my editing is done in Lightroom. The only time I go to Photoshop or some other type of plugins is if I'm doing HDR. I'm using Photomatics. Um, if I'm doing a portrait and I want to do like a head swap, I'll go to Photoshop or if I'm combining elements, which is really not my thing. I don't do a lot of composites kind of stuff. So most of my dodging and burning is just simply in Lightroom using the adjustment tool. So what he's talking about is called a targeted adjustment. So it's not darkening the whole image or lightening the whole image. It's just one area that's too bright or too dark. But yes, I do. Great, and I think you should also address because um, it will answer a few questions here about um, getting uh, just address um, getting the shot right on your camera instead of having to fix things in Photoshop. Okay. Or Lightroom. Okay, I mean getting the getting the shot on camera involves a number of different things, right? Getting the exposure right, um, and getting the exposure quote right is also subjective because. Um, if you want your image to look a little bit darker, such as let's say you have a black cat sitting on a black couch, you don't want it to be in the middle of your histogram. Okay, so learning to read your histogram will help you understand your exposure. Okay, um, getting your exposure right for the scene. Okay, and right for your intention for that picture is important. Okay, making sure that it's in focus. Um, out of focus pictures are very hard to fix later. That's not something you can fix. Problems with the background. Again, I'm going to recommend looking in, at that when you take the picture, okay? Um, if you're doing pictures of people, things that might need fixing later would be uh, straightening a tie or, you know, somebody's hair is sticking out or something like that. Whenever I photograph people, I almost always have an assistant with me. If you don't have the luxury of that, bring a friend or get somebody in the group to help you sort of just have a second pair of eyes and fix those things when you're shooting, absolutely. Because it takes 30 seconds or less to fix somebody's hair and straighten their tie when you're shooting it, and it takes 10 minutes or, or more to fix it in Photoshop, and it, it, costs, it costs your time as money, right? Especially if you're doing this or you're trying to do this um, for as a living, even part-time. Yeah, it's way it's way quicker to fix it on the scene than to absolutely fix it in the Photoshop. Okay, uh, Derek Remillard wants to know: Have you ever used panning for portraits? For portraits? Ah, that's an interesting question. Uh, yes. I have not, but now you've got me intrigued, Derek. <laughs> um, yes and no. Uh, I guess I guess I have because um, I have an article that I'm going to be writing on on photographing kids for digital photography school um, coming up and one of the things I do when I photograph kids especially if I'm doing more of a documentary thing where I follow them around um, I've done that with both my niece and my nephew is they move constantly this is the thing with kids right and yes I have done some panning with them so it, it may not be so much as a classical portrait per se um, more as of a documentary style photography which I, I've come full circle in my history. I've come from a background of doing classically posed lit portraits, um, you know, with a medium format film camera where everything is stationary to running around after, you know, three year olds chasing them with a camera and trying to capture what their life is like. Um, so it just depends on the style of photography you want to do, but I think that's a great idea. If you'd like to do that and share it with us, that'd be awesome. Okay, I'm going to ask some. Um some filter questions and then go back to an HDR. I'm just going to ask so a, a random question of the whole group. Um, using the little put up your hand thing, um, how many people have found this this valuable today? Just stick up your hand. Holy cow. Awesome. Awesome. Wow. Thanks, guys. Okay. <laughs> um, we're going to come back to this HDR question uh, regarding software, but uh, some questions regarding filters. Um, which lens do you have a neutral density on? I'm going to read them all, Dar. Uh, which lens do you have a neutral density on? 
and um, what about the circular polarized filter? Okay. And here's one I know you, I think you wrote about this, uh, variable density filters versus neutral, neutral density filters. Fixed, okay. So yes, those are all kind of related. Um, I have the neutral density filter for my 24 to 105 Canon lens. That is the one that I use most commonly. It's also the biggest um, diameter. Okay, so if you have multiple lenses, you can buy what's called a step down ring. And it's just a little ring that adapts the filter that's bigger to fit on the smaller diameter lens. Okay, so buy the biggest one that you need and get the step down rings for the smaller one. So that should answer that question. It also tends to be the one that I use, the lens that I use the most for doing landscapes, which is probably where I'm going to use my ND filter. Okay, um, the polarizing filter, I do have one. And I'll be quite honest with you, it's a pain in the butt most of the time, and I don't get it out. Um, because I tend to do a lot of photography in the evening and in the morning, um, my sky, if you're wanting to darken the sky, I, I tend to be able to get my sky color under control because of the time of day that I'm photographing. If you find yourself out during the day and you need to darken your sky, absolutely bring it with you. Um, it's just a matter of you know making sure you have it in your bag and that you remember to use it. Uh, no, uh, there's a oh, the variable. Question. Yes. The other oh, yeah. question was about the variable. Um, mm -hmm. I have a variable ND and it goes from about one and a half stops to, I think, eight. So eight stops is a lot of light. Okay. If you're not familiar with the term stop, what that means is every stop is double the amount of light. So eight is two times two times two times two, eight times. Okay. So it works out to, it, it's a lot darker. So I have the variable one um, because as I rotate it, it gets darker or, or lighter. Um, if you get a fixed one, it just means that you have less options. Okay, that was from Rhythm Sing. Great, right, thank you. Um, Rhythm, cool. Yeah. I know you've I commented on the blog before. Thanks for joining us. Now, uh, Greg Lukens wants to know about uh, Photomatics uh, over NIC for HDR. Aha, I think he emailed me this question. Um, I personally use Photomatics and I always have. Um, I haven't tried the latest incarnation of Nick since, you know, Google took it over and I may do so and, and do a review to compare the current version, but I've always used Photomatics. Um, number one reason I do that is because I have more control over the settings and I, I'm not a big person of, I like to just click a preset and don't know what it's doing. So if you're of the same mind as me, I like to know what's going on in the background. Why is that doing that? Because if I know why it's doing it, I can either undo it or do it to a lesser degree, right? So if I have full control of the sliders to get the effect that I want in Photomatics, I can, I can pull it back. Whereas if I've clicked a preset, I don't know what's happened in the background to make that happen. And I find that a lot of the Nick was more presets. Um, if you're a person that just wants to do it real fast and click a couple of presets and, and be done with it, I would say hey, give it a try. Okay. As far as I know, they both have trial versions. So download them and compare them and, and see which, which works for you okay, and your, your sort of working style. Good answer. Uh, Sumeya Schnur okay. wants to know, handheld or tripod? If you had a choice, which would you choose if you put on the spot? Oh, see, it also depends. You know, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of questions I... that the answer to that is it depends. Um, I just wrote an article on family portrait tips, which is on, on digital photography school, if you're interested in that one, on why you want to use a tripod for family pictures. Um, if I'm doing a portrait, I absolutely, most of the time, have my camera on the tripod. Two reasons. Number one, it's going to keep the camera still. And number two, it allows me to get out from behind the camera. So allow me to, if I can reach my camera. Ooh, maybe not. When I'm taking somebody's portrait, can you guys still hear me? When I'm taking somebody's portrait, when I'm sticking a camera in their face, I'm not doing a lot of interacting when I'm doing this, right? And they're interacting with the lens. When I get the camera onto a tripod, now I can look at them in the face and talk to them because people that are being photographed are nervous, right? Especially portraits. So I want to interact with them and, and make sure that they understand what's going on and they feel comfortable doing this. So a portrait is definitely when I will use a tripod. If I'm doing HDR and I have a tripod and I'm not hiking six miles to get to this place, I definitely will use a tripod. If I'm traveling, 
Again, if I'm out all day, I may or may not carry mine around with me, or I may have a smaller one. So it totally depends on the situation. Um, having a tripod is not a bad thing. Um, people find that they're cumbersome. Um, I've had them in my workshops where I make people use a tripod and they're angry at me at first. And then they start to understand that when you put your camera on a tripod, it also makes you slow down. And it forces you to think about what you're photographing and what's in the scene. So all the stuff that we learn today, it makes you do that stuff. Off. And you're not just going click, 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 click. Mm -hmm. And then when she says that she's carrying the tripod, that means that I'm carrying the tripod. <laughs> just for um, uh, everybody's information, Rob is also known as my husband. When using the rule of thirds, is it advisable that your image take you from the left to the right? As is how most people read. Or he's, uh, he says, that's uh, from Derek Rimmelard, says, I often will have my image read from right to left, change it up and be different. Aha. Uh -huh. um, you know, you can do either. And there's a sort of an unspoken, hidden, subliminal message in depending on which way your image flows. Absolutely. In our North American culture and English culture, we read left to right, um, top to bottom. You know, if you come from an Asian culture, that's completely different. Right. So, again, that could be a cultural thing. But if you're going left to right, top to bottom, and you place your subjects so that they're facing left to right, there's the subliminal thing of, okay, now i got to get this right. Am I facing left now, Rob? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not even looking at you. I'm looking okay. at questions. So when you're facing left, I think right. I'm doing it wrong. This is left? Yes. Okay. So when you're facing left and your subject is looking this way, it's like they're looking into the future, okay, because we read left to right. So that's forward, okay? Oh. When I'm facing this way, it's like you're looking back into the past, okay? And that sort of applies to the subject, which is why going back to my little picture of the rock in the stream, I moved the rock from the left-hand side so the water wasn't flowing into it. It was flowing away from it into the future. It just felt to me more comfortable, okay? Um, there's also, for me generally, if you have um, a person or even a thing uh, looking in a certain direction, they want to have space in front of them for it to go, right? Whether it be left or right, you want them to have space for it to for them to look, okay? If you cut off the image and there's more space behind them than in front of them, it's not wrong or it's not bad. It just has a very different feel. The image will feel instantly tense. You'll have more tension and more drama, okay? So if you want tension and drama, push the boundaries a little bit, okay? So that's that part of knowing the rules, and then break them. Mm -hmm. And I think for your example, your examples were exactly opposite of what you intended. Oh, for my. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, I'm on a video right. camera, so sorry, guys, if I'm facing the wrong way. I don't see myself. Okay, uh, just a comment from Sharon Austin who says thank you, and she needs to stop trying to journalize everything and take more time to get a good picture. Uh -huh. with that. Um, here's a question from David Mackey. He says, uh, low light for him includes off-camera flash. Uh, he shoots a lot of roller derby ambient lit. Not sure if off-camera flash is a good answer, but something to explore. Okay. Um, if it's roller derby, then, I mean, you are you have to abide by the rules of the venue and the sport, right? Um, some, some venues and some sports don't allow flash. Like when I do weddings, some churches do and some don't, right? So it's about knowing the rules. Um, find out who's in charge and ask before you go ahead and do it and get in trouble. Um, or you can work the way I often work. If it's a paid job, you definitely want to ask ahead of time. If it's something that you're just doing ahead of time or on, on your own for fun, um, I tend to subscribe to the ask for forgiveness, not permission rule, because I'll just go do it and then say, oops, I'm sorry, I didn't know. Um, so if you're doing it as a paid job, by all means, get permission and find out what the rules are first, because if they don't allow flash, don't use it. Okay. okay um, this, I think, is a complex question. Uh, Ooh. Jody Penning says, I have trouble getting correct exposure on site. I do know how to read a histogram, and often the photos seem correct on the viewfinder. What are some tips on getting the exposure right? Okay. Well, the number one thing is your viewfinder is going to trick you. Okay. So the viewfinder, the picture itself can be brightened or darkened, just like your view, just like your monitor on your computer. Okay. So if you're looking at it based on how it looks on the screen, yeah, you may be off if your screen is set bright. So for example, if you've got the brightness on your camera turned all the way up, your pictures may look okay, but in reality, they're dark. 
Okay, so they'll be the opposite of what is happening. Okay, if you find that all your pictures are coming out too dark, try looking at your brightness. What you want to look for in a histogram, there is no right or wrong histogram um, reading, and there is no such thing as a perfect one. It has to represent the scene because if you have a light colored object, your histogram is going to be more to the right. If you have a dark colored object, it's going to be more to the left. Okay. What you want to look for are things going off the histogram, which is called clipping. So if you're going off to the right, then you've got a lot of areas that are overexposed. Okay? Most cameras have a thing that you can turn on called the highlight warning. I like to call it the blinkies, where if you have a picture that is overexposed in certain areas, that area will flash and it will tell you, okay, that is overexposed with no detail. Okay, So there's no going back. And so that will give you an indication of you need to scale back your exposure a little bit. Okay? Um, I would also kind of ask you what modes you're using, and maybe you can type this in the chat and Rob can let me know whether you're shooting in manual or shutter, shutter priority, aperture priority, or how what mode you're shooting in. Mm -hmm. And speaking of modes, uh, Sumia Schnur is asking what mode do you shoot? Huh. Um, I shoot in probably two modes most often. Um, I, I never shoot in program. Okay. Uh, I shoot in aperture priority probably most of the time. Uh, if I'm just walking around and traveling, especially because my style, I love a wide aperture. So I'm often shooting at f2.8 or something wide open. So I will set that and just leave my camera on that. And the camera will pick the shutter speed for me. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. If I'm doing something like panning, then I switch over to shutter priority and I set my shutter, shutter speed. Okay. As soon as I'm doing something generally on a tripod, so it's kind of related to that, um, if I'm doing a portrait on a tripod where the situation is not changing. So the people are not moving, I'm not moving, the light is not moving, I'm gonna go manual because I want all of the pictures to be consistently exposed and not change. And I will also do the same with my white balance. I pick one of the presets, not auto white balance. And that then speeds up your post-processing time. because Exactly, exactly. Light. Exactly. Makes your life very, very simple. Thank you for that. Uh, Charlene Williams. Hi, Charlene. Hey, Charlene. Uh, she's asking you to just quickly recap your Lightroom uh, editing. Uh, she says, you mentioned how you edit in Lightroom. Would you please review that again? Okay. So, I mean, the main sliders in the basic panel are your exposure, your whites and your blacks, your highlights and your shadows. That's sort of your main panel. And then you have the clarity, which increases like local contrast. Um, vibrance and saturation. So those are probably the key sliders that you're going to use, as well as your color adjustments at the top for your white balance. Right. So those are the ones that I use the most to set up how my picture looks. I generally will also add um, a post crop vignette. Uh, I will usually add a lens correction. So lens correction will correct things like chromatic aberration automatically for your lens. Um, uh, lens distortion, so if you're using a wide, it corrects the, the barrel edges kind of thing. Um, I will often, if I'm using a high ISO, add some noise reduction and some sharpening as well. So most of that, if you got it right in camera, that's all you have to do. Okay? If you have to start doing dodging and burning, then you need to start using the adjustment brush and paint in literally the areas that you want to adjust. And you can do more than just adjust exposure with it, like I'll adjust um, for example, I'll do my facial retouching on a portrait using Lightroom and I have an adjustment brush that lowers the clarity, which gets rid of a lot of the pores on the face, but still leaves texture and I increase the contrast and I call it my glamour brush and you can save things that you use over and over again as presets, which I do a lot. Okay. So I save a lot of presets. I have them set up in a folder called Darlene's favorite presets. And those are the ones that I use. And that also helps me keep my processing down to less than two minutes an image. Um, all right. So here's a question regarding the course, <clears throat> the four weeks to better photography course you're offering. Um, so we have 70 has, keeners that are still with us. Woohoo! Yeah, yeah, it's great. Uh, she has limited data download. Uh, if she was going to join the four week course, how many megabytes approximately would each week use? I think she's referring to downloading of sample images. Um, uh, you don't. You won't need to be downloading much. The videos will be online, so you can watch them online. You don't have to download anything. They'll be they'll be stored on YouTube, and you'll have a private link to them. Um, so no, your bandwidth shouldn't shouldn't be an issue at all. Um, uploading pictures to to Flickr, uh, you don't need to put really large ones. So 
if that's a concern, um, email me. Um, I'll put in my, my email into the, the chat here. So if you have a question specifically about that and you're concerned about something or you're not sure if it's the right class for you, just send me a question by email and um, I'll try and answer any other questions that you have about that. But I think you'd be okay for bandwidth on this one. Okay, what is your PP, two minute workflow? My PP? Yeah, I'm wondering if that's Photoshop. Some, can somebody clarify that? Who had the question? Don Verdon. Can you clarify that question for us, Don, and we'll come back to that? Okay, and while he's typing, while he's typing okay. that, as I know he's still here. Um, Could mean photomatics. Uh, da, da, da. Sorry, I had to scroll down. Thanks for sticking with us, guys. Um, I'm just going to move to the next slide while Rob's doing that. Um, so you have on the screen how to get in touch with me. So I'm on Facebook, on my Facebook page. There's my Twitter. There's the Flickr group. And you can also contact me on my website using the contact form. And of course, I just give you my, my private email address as well. So if you have any questions about um, anything we covered today, the full week class, or anything else, as usual, I'm always um, ex ex accessible. <laughs> Can't speak English very well, but um, I'm accessible. Derek Rimmelard's asking regarding lens selection. Do you feel it better for someone to get a prime lens, or perhaps get a professional zoom lens, like a 50 f 1.8 versus 17 to 55 f 2.8? Okay, that's going to depend. Um, sorry, what was the second lens option? 70 to 200 to 8. Uh, 50 millimeter f 1.8 versus a 17 to 55 f 2.8. Ah, okay. Um. Probably in all honesty, either of those would do you really well. 2.8 is a nice a nice wide aperture, and it gives you the same you know range because you it'll incorporate your 50. Um, but the 518 is just a great little lens to have, even in addition to that. It gives you the bigger aperture, and the thing that I like about it is it's teeny tiny. Um, you know, go look at one at the store. It weighs a couple ounces. So to throw it in your bag and take it with you no matter where you're going is, is not a big deal. So it costs nothing. It weighs nothing, and, and it's just great to have along. So if you don't have your other zoom with you, um, if you're in a situation where you're in low light and you can't use flash, throw on the 518 and um, it'll do you well. Cool. John Paul asks, I do a lot of photography by feel. I use a lot of what I've learned, but I still like to go by feel. Is this mm -hmm. a lazy approach? Um, sort of like your gut instinct. Is that what he means? I'm going to say it does. Yep. Okay. Um, I think that's a great way to do it, actually. Uh, a lot of people get hung up on the technical stuff and you're approaching it from the other side, which is which is here, you know, or here, depending on where you, you feel your photography. And I think, to be honest, you're probably ahead of the curve. Um, you know, if you're if you're getting great pictures, don't worry so much about the technical. Um, I've, I've told people in my classes, if, if the technical stuff is overwhelming you, by all means, throw it in program, you know, stick it in an auto mode and, and just work on practicing your craft, work on refining the things that we talked about today that have nothing to do with, with technical stuff. So uh, I think there's nothing wrong with that, by all means. Yeah, that, addressing, that addresses shooting for yourself instead of for some, you know, criterion. Yes. Did we get an answer uh, on the PP question? Oh, yeah, I have to scroll down. Sorry. Uh, Post-processing. Okay, so and, and you wanted a whole workflow on that? A two-minute workflow. What's your two-minute oh workflow? <laughs> oh, for the whole two minutes. Um, well, my, my workflow starts when I import my images. So I take my memory card. Um, I happen to have a couple of them sticking out of a card reader. So I take my, my memory cards and I stick them in the card reader. I always use a card reader, not from camera, because the card reader is faster. If you have USB or US, USB 2 or 3, it's going to be faster than plugging it in and taking it from your camera. Um, also, if your camera battery dies during transfer, you can uh, have your card crash and lose your images. Okay, so invest the 20 bucks and get a card reader if your computer doesn't have one. So I import directly into Lightroom. Okay? Um, if you're shooting RAW, you have the option of converting to DNG, which is digital negative, or you can convert later. Um, depending on the project, I may or may not convert at the time of import. I will add some keywords so that I can search for these pic pictures later. Okay? And I will tell the, the program where to save them. So I transfer them from my memory card onto my 
hard drive, which is off my laptop. So I work exclusively with a laptop. All my heart, all my images live on hard drive number A, letter A. And once I've done that, I physically manually take a copy of them. The whole folder goes over hard drive B. Okay. I also use backblaze.com um, for my, my backups. And what that does is it backs up a screenshot of my workstation. So um, how do I explain that? Uh, anything that's currently plugged in, it gets backed up. Okay, and that's off site. I'll give you a link to that. And it's super inexpensive. It's like five bucks a month. And I think I paid for the year and it was 50 bucks. Okay. And it'll back up your laptop and your externals. Once I have everything on my on my hard drives and I want to work with them in Lightroom, what I do first is I call the pictures. Okay, now this is one big thing that a lot of people don't do is delete the edits. Don't just keep them. If you've shot 5,000 pictures on your trip to wherever, let's say you went to Greece, if you shot 5,000 pictures, you're not going to keep 5,000 pictures. So if you go through and decide, okay, here's my 500 favorite, if we're going with our 10% ratio, uh, dump the others, for heaven's sake, because you're filling up your hard drive, and it just makes your whole workflow a lot more complicated, okay? So then I'm going to work with those 500. Everybody has a different sort of workflow, um, where they save them, how they name them, that kind of thing. Uh, that's kind of a longer question in terms of Lightroom, but my workflow inside of Lightroom is once I pick the picture that I'm going to work on, I take it to the develop module. Uh, first thing I'm going to adjust is exposure. So if my exposure is out at all, that's the first thing I'm going to fix. Um, if it needs fixing, and then I'm going to add a vignette, my lens correction, and then I'm going to do any local adjustments and finalize it up. And Backblaze really is brilliant. Um, it's uh, saved her butt a couple of times, and um, <laughs> it has. We, we recommend it. And it, it really is really simple. And the links there in the chat window. Um, got a question from Sharon. Says someone once told us to never delete photos while in camera, only in card after. Is uh -huh. that true? It's dangerous um, to delete photos in camera. That's a is good. It? It, yeah, it, it's a good point. To it's a good habit to get into for two reasons, because. Um, Number one, the pictures never look the same on the, on the cameras they do on the computer, and you may end up deleting something that looks better than you thought it did on the camera. Okay. Um, number two, you can make an accident and delete by mistake. I've done that. Uh, and number three, you're doing what's called chimping. If you, it's a <laughs> it's a jargon, a photography jargon. Um, chimping is basically looking at your pictures instead of taking more pictures. So get away from trying to edit in camera. And, and just take more pictures. Here's a question from Holly. Do you shoot outdoors with additional lights and gear? Noticed uh, photos in magazines like US Weekly that an outdoor portrait pops. Do you think it's mostly the shoot or post editing? Uh -huh. Well, funny you ask that because if you go to the website today, I just posted an article today and you'll get a, an email about it tomorrow if you're a subscriber on using flash outdoors. So off camera flash outdoors for portraits. Um, yes, I often use flash outdoors, even though there's enough quantity of light. It's not the right quality of light. So it's not coming from the right direction. It's overhead or it's it's ugly light. So oftentimes I am augmenting what is there with some flash or a reflector. Okay? I'm going to ask this question on behalf of David Mack. And, and if I'm just going to add the magazine shoots that you see, um, a lot of them, especially if you're looking at uh, Annie Leibovitz kind of stuff, she's a master of lighting. Oftentimes her outdoor shoots involve six, eight lights and generators and a staff of 12 and they're quite involved. So yeah, a lot of times when you see these things that pop, they've probably added some light. There's a question from David Mackey and um, the answer, I know because we go through this a lot at our house, um, the answer depends on um, if I'm coming along or not. <laughs> he wants to know if he's totally torn when he leaves the house, he can't decide between his 8518 or his 514. So he takes all four, 24 to 70, 7200, 2.8, 8, etc. Okay, now who asked the question? David? David Mackey. Okay, so David, I have a challenge for you. Okay, my challenge for you is to leave your house with your 50 and nothing else one day, and that's it. Okay, so 
that's called limiting yourself. So when you when you impose limitations on yourself, such as I mentioned earlier about using a tripod, okay, that's a limitation because you've lost the flexibility of movement, right? So when you limit yourself with a lens, especially a prime one, okay, you've limited yourself in the zoom range that you can use. So it forces you to be creative other ways. So like we talked about earlier, um, trying to differentiate if you only have one lens, it makes you get creative. Okay. Um, I don't know if there's any pet owners out there. We have cats. Anybody else have cats or dogs? We buy them toys. What do they want to play with? A twist tie and a drinking straw. They get creative. They don't need fancy toys. I don't think we do either. This is how, do, how do you like that right? analogy? <laughs> this is being recorded, right, Dar? Yes. Okay, there you go. That answers a lot of questions because uh, I wasn't even sure. Um, I'm just going to tell a quick It quick says story. recording. Like I said, I'm new to this, so it says recording, and there's a little red button, so I'm assuming so. And mine doesn't, so that's why I was asking because I haven't been able to answer that. But though uh, we've uh, we traveled quite a bit, and we were in Asia, going all through Asia, and after me carrying a backpack in Thailand when it was like 40 degrees or 100 degrees Fahrenheit, <laughs> um, carrying a tripod that she never used for a lot of times, a really heavy tripod, which I, ended up, I bought her at Carbon Fiber. Eventually, one day I said, you know, you go on your own. I'm going to do my own thing. Darlene says, you know, <laughs> I'm just going to take my lens, the one lens today. <laughs> yeah, when I'm not carrying it, she simplifies. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um, it's the name true. Of the backup program is. Back so, for those of you that don't know Rob, he's six foot two. He can kind of carry a lot more stuff than me. <laughs> uh, the backup program is Backblaze. There's a link in the chat. It's herbivotography.com slash backblaze, yep. all one word. Um, and if you miss any of this stuff, again, just email or tweet us or what have you. Okay, and just bear with me a second. I have to scroll through some messages. Still got 60 um, people left. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You guys are the diehards, seriously. How wide of a wide angle lens do you use, Darlene? That's asked by Janice. Um, the widest one that I have is a 17 on my full frame camera. So that would be equal to about a 12 if you have a cropped sensor camera. Would I like to have a wider one? Sure. Um, 15 on a, on a full frame is about as wide as you can go without it becoming a circle. So I'd love to have a 15. It's not in my budget right now. Uh, there's a question from Chris. Oh, I won't pronounce the last name. Uh, Chris asks, he has, I have issues in the printing process. Pictures look great on the computer screen, but seldom come out looking good out of the printer. Do you have any suggestions in correcting this issue? Uh -huh. Yes. Okay, so the biggest thing there, remember I mentioned earlier, Chris, about the monitor on your camera? You can brighten and darken your, your screen. The same thing applies to your computer. So if your computer monitor is is not what's called neutral or calibrated you're going to get the opposite result coming out as a print okay so if you have a monitor that's too dark you're going to have light colored prints because it's 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 giving you a sense of if your monitor is dark you're going to try and brighten the pictures up in your post processing and then you're going to end up with light prints if your monitor is too bright you're going to end up with dark prints is that what i just said um, or the opposite and the same is true with color so if your monitor is out to lunch color wise if your monitor is on the blue side you're going to get yellow or warm pictures coming out prints if your monitor is yellow you're going to get blue prints coming out so what you want to do is you want to look at a device that calibrates your monitor because if you're at the point where you're talking about critical calibration and you want consistent results to come out and your post processing invest in a device called either the spider pro and i'll type it into the chat make sure you get the pro one not the light version um, another one that's popular is a color monkey and what they do color monkey is a lot more expensive spider pro is about 150 bucks um, if you have friends, so again, this goes back to joining a group. So if you have a group of people locally, buy one of these devices and then share them because you only need to run this on your on your computer about every couple of weeks. Okay. So if you accidentally hit the brightness on your on your keyboard, which I do sometimes, and I need to run my calibration again, um, just get the device from your buddy and, and share it. Okay. It also gives you an excuse to get together um, and go have coffee or go take some pictures to pass the device back and forth. Okay. Um, I just have a question. I want to find out if people are actually. Does that answer your in. question, Chris? Just put your hand up if that answered your question. Yeah, it looks like it did. Awesome. Um, 
Oh, I'm sorry, I'm yes, moving around on the screen. Perfect. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. I see that his hand went up. Yep. Uh, how important is white balance to portraiture? Uh huh. Um, I would say not as important as if you're doing product photography. Okay, if you are a product photographer and you're photographing this lovely water bottle, it better come out in the prints or in their ad exactly the same color. Okay, so if you're doing commercial photography, calibration is absolutely key to the perfect. Okay, if you're doing portraits, not so much. If you're doing fine art or landscape, not so much. Um, I tend to have my portraits come out a little bit on the warmer side because nobody has ever said um, I look too tanned, right? So if they come out a little bit more orangey or, or warm, they'll just look like they have a bit of a tan versus if they come out too blue, they look kind of um, rigor mortis and um, like they need some CPR, right? So portrait stuff is, is subjective. If you're doing fashion, you may want to err, you know, more on the blue side if you're doing an effect, you know, if you're doing zombies or something, right? So it's really subjective and fine art is totally subjective. It's whatever you want it to look like, really. Um, it brings up a good point, though, about if somebody tells you that something is wrong with your pictures. Um, if, if it's a client, then you have a concern. If you're trying to do this to make a living, then you have a, a, an issue that you need to solve. But if it's somebody on Facebook or whatever social media that you're on or a friend, um, if somebody tells you there's something wrong with your picture, just, you know, whatever, let it bounce off. Because if you like it, who cares? That's all that matters. All right, I have another question here. And uh, this one has popped up a few times in regards to this. So uh, I live in India, so there's a lot of religious culture, but I find it difficult to compose an iconic shot thing is that I can't do it in a crowded place because I just can't seem to eliminate a particular element. So how do I bring simplicity? Okay. Can I, I, I was going to guess, but I, I'll let you answer. <laughs> now Rob's the expert. Um, first of all, I'm I, visiting India is on my bucket list. I would love to visit your country. So um, in a way, I'm sort of envious. We're always more interested in what's in other people's backyards, right? So you have interesting subject matter. Um, you have to be careful with religious um icons of any kind uh i visited turkey which is a very muslim country and you know they talk about um photographing not inside religious places or not ceremonial um instances so if somebody is praying i mean you certainly want to respect their privacy and not photograph them if you want to get something like that you may have to interact now you have the benefit of speaking the language in india i don't so when it's time to come to india i'm, I'm going to come and see you um you can interact with them and find out if it's okay to take their picture before you take it sometimes you need to ask and that would be one of those cases because religion is a very touchy subject and Personally, I don't want to offend somebody. I'm not going to go and push the limits and get a photograph in at the expense of offending somebody or potentially getting arrested. You know, um, as a foreigner in a different country, if I visit a country and I don't know all the rules, I err on the side of caution. Okay, so in in your own country, you probably are familiar with the religion far more than I am and the laws and the rules. Um, you may have to just approach somebody and set something up a little bit, not so much that, you know, you put them in a place, but if you see something in a scene that's happening that you want to photograph and simplify, and sometimes getting their permission is just simply, you know, having the camera point you to it and just, you know, asking them with the nod of the head, is it okay? Which is what I do a lot of times when I'm traveling, like in Thailand, for example, I don't speak Thai. Um, you know, the extent of my Thai is three words. So, um, nodding with my head yes or no and they will indicate whether they want their picture taken and if they say yes you have full-on permission to to do so but just respect their privacy um can you use a circular polarizer and an nd filter at the same time 
Um, I don't see why not, but it's kind of redundant. Um, the polarizer is going to darken things, but the polarizer also serves a different purpose because if you have a reflection, like say on a glass, on a window that you want to get rid of, um, the reflection is polarized. So polarized just means that the light rays are, are bouncing a certain direction. And when you use the polarizing filter, you eliminate light coming from that direction. So you can get rid of reflections a lot of times. It'll also help you darken your sky. Okay? So the neutral density filter is purely just dark. The polarizer helps you get rid of reflections and, and darken your sky. Oops. But if, for example, you have a, a neutral density filter that's not dark enough, you can stack them and it's not a problem. Uh, do you have any suggestions of good photo hosting websites that show large images to the public, maybe for selling prints as well? Uh, well, yes, I do. Uh, the one that I use for my site is Zenfolio. And um, I've used them for years. There's other ones out like um, Smug Mug is popular. I put a link in the chat um, to get more information on Zenfolio. I use it because, um, number one, I've just been using it a long time, probably seven years. Um, it morphed from a different company. They changed names and merged with another company. Smug Mug is newer. They have a lot of great features. They have um, a new, brand new interface that looks really great, but they're triple the price. I pay $125 a year, honestly. Um, if you want to build a website, you can use Zenfolio. It even has a blog um, component built into it now. You can blog right in Zenfolio. You can sell prints. You can have different price lists. So for example, I have a fine art price list that I sell my prints if people want a print of, of my travel photography. I have a different one for portraits because that's a different different game. I can also lock a gallery. So if I'm doing a portrait and the people don't want their stuff public, I can lock that gallery and give them the password. Um, so you can set different prices. You can set how the interface looks and what it looks like on your screen in terms of how the gallery displays. Um, go through some of their videos and look at some of their features. That's the one that I prefer. OK, what internal settings do you have your camera set on for contrast, saturation, and brightness? Um, I'm going to clarify that question and ask them if they're shooting RAW or not. Who asked the question? Jody Pennings. Jody, can you tell us if you're shooting JPEG or RAW? Because the answer to that question is, if you are shooting RAW, it doesn't matter. Not RAW. Not RAW. Okay. So I'm shooting RAW. So for my camera, it doesn't matter. Okay. Um, if you're shooting JPEG, what happens when you um, shoot RAW versus JPEG is your camera always shoots a RAW file and it carries more data. Okay. If you set your camera to shoot JPEGs only, it shoots a RAW file applies the settings that you're talking about, contrast, um, saturation, and sharpness to your RAW file, and then dumps the RAW file and saves it as a JPEG, okay? Um, my camera isn't doing that. I'm doing those things in Lightroom later, okay? So if you want, um, eventually I find that everybody that gets a DSLR, maybe not everybody, uh, a lot of people that get DSLRs move from letting the camera control those things over to I want to control that. Okay. I don't know about you, but I'm a bit of a control freak. No comments, please, Rob. Um, <laughs> and I like to be able to adjust those things later because the disadvantage of doing it in camera is you can't undo it. Okay, So if you set your sharpness too high or your saturation too high or too low, you can't go back and undo it later in Photoshop. I can in Lightroom. It's, it's what's called non-destructive editing. I can always change it later. I hope that answers your question. A uh, question here about... I don't know the term, um, chimping. Uh, <laughs> are you, if you're testing your exposure, is chimping okay? Yes. For exposure, I give you full permission to check your, your back of your screen. If It depends. If your scene is changing a lot, you want to keep an eye on it. Um, just don't tend to do it a lot. It, it wears your battery down, too, because you're always looking at the back of the screen. You're going to kill your battery faster. I want to get really soft water movement. Can I do this without special filters? Um, yes, if you are shooting in dim light. If you are out in bright sunlight, take a look at my waterfall article, and um, that will give you a better idea of why you need to have a neutral density filter on it in the bright sun. You can't get anything slower than about a 15th or a 30th of a second in bright sunlight. OK. Um, is there a definite advantage to full frame versus crop sensor other than cleaner images at higher ISOs? Oh, this is a pet peeve question of mine. Um, I get asked this a lot in my classes, and I have probably talked 
four of my students out of buying a full frame camera. Okay. My question back to you would be, what are you going to do with it? Okay. To get a full frame camera, I mean, now with the Canon 6D, you can probably get in for $2,000, but you're still talking about $2,000 and up just for the body. Okay. So if you are a serious photographer at this, um, you want to do it for a living, then you might want to consider that. Or if you have more money than time, which some people do, um, and you really, really like this hobby and you have the money to spend, by all means, go for it. Um, but if you're, you know, the average person and you can't afford a two or $3,000 camera and you just want to take pictures for yourself, you probably don't need it. Um, the camera that I started with was a Canon 10D, which was six megapixels, okay? My iPhone has more megapixels than that camera. And I made prints that were up to 40 inches wide with absolutely no problem. Okay, it was not a full frame camera because there didn't exist at that time. Okay. Does that answer their question? I think you may have answered this, but I'll ask it and you can just quickly say this. Uh, do you calibrate your camera and monitor? If yes, what do you use? Um, I, my camera, no. My monitor, yes, I use the Spider Pro. That's what I thought. Could you recommend a way? or an exercise to practice getting a sharp focus on shots. Uh, this commenter Scott says he's finding that I can't use a lot of my shots because of the focus being just slightly off. That's a tough question to answer because um, there could be a technical problem with the camera. Um, sometimes lenses fall out of calibration, so you may need to get your lens checked. If you've dropped it, absolutely, you want to get it checked. Same thing with the body. If anything is out of alignment, if the lens is not mounted correctly, um, a half a millimeter out will throw your pictures out of focus. Rob knows all too well about dropped lenses because um, I had one that was quite expensive that turned into an instant lens baby. So I would say check your equipment first. Um, if you're having trouble with focus, you, you want to look at a bunch of different things. You want to look at, is your shutter speed fast enough, would be my first question. Um, the one biggest thing I always recommend is that your slowest shutter speed you want to use handheld is one over your focal length, or one divided by your focal length. So if you're using a 200 millimeter lens, you don't want anything slower than a 200th of a second. Okay, because what you're seeing in sharpness there or lack of sharpness is probably camera shake from your end of the camera. I don't know if that helps or not. Um, I want to get a large format printer, gallery quality prints on different paper formats. How do pigments do better than ink? Oh boy. Um, unfortunately, I know nothing about that topic. I don't print my own prints, unfortunately. Um, a good person to ask that, however, um, would be Martin Bailey, who I interviewed a couple weeks ago. And there's an interview with him under my interview section, and he also has a book on printing, um, which is a craft and vision book. So if you take a look at Martin's interview, we didn't talk about printing, but I may have him on again as a, as a guest, and we'll talk about that topic as a future um, subject. He is an expert on printing. So I would say find Martin Bailey and ask him that question. Hmm. If you email uh, me, gonna... if you email me, I'll send you a link to his uh, his book on printing. Have you ever done any double exposures? I don't know if you would have, to have done this. You would have done um, film. when I did film a long, long time ago. I mean, I haven't been filmed since 2004. Um, not currently with digital, and I tend to not do sort of superimposed stuff or composites. Not really my style, no. Yeah, I did it in like 1983. Unless you're um, counting HDR where I do do multiple shots and put them together, um, but it's more of an exposure blending, a tone mapping, than it is a double exposure because it's the same subject. Oh, and Sharon Austin is letting us know that Craft, uh, not Craft Vision, uh, that Zenfolio is having a 20% off sale for the next three days. Oh, and also today, um, do you have a link to Craft and Vision? I think it's... Uh, what is our link to Craft Vision? Yeah, I can send it out. Yeah. yeah, if you could send that out. They're also having a 50% sale, and it ends to, tonight. So if you want anything off the Craft and Vision um, site, Rob's going to put a link to that. They, um, they have 50% off today as well. And there was a lovely video that came out yesterday of David Dushman in a pink tutu, which was quite humorous. Okay, so for those of you that are still with me, I'm, I'm amazed we're at, um, you know, 740. Um, let's try and wrap up in the next 10 minutes. So if you have another question, let's get to those. Um, if, if I don't answer your question, uh, please email it to me and I will answer them. There's really only a couple left, Dar. Um, awesome. 
Awesome. And actually, it's uh, it's noon in some places around the world. People are listening while they're at work. <laughs> I won't mention any names. Um, Perfect. We won't tell on you. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, I'm honored to make your work day go a little a little more pleasantly. One of my favorite new sayings was, uh, "Life, life, live life like it's pleasant. Live in the present moment, and if it's unpleasant, have a cookie." <laughs> Um, okay. Well, if you could buy the one of the most expensive lenses, which would you start with two thousand dollars and up? I think that's just a quick, quick answer. Wow. Um, geez, where's my shopping list? Uh Canon makes a lot of good stuff that's really expensive. Anything in their L series line is is amazing with the you know coveted red line around it. Um I would jump at the um 17, I think it's a 17 to 40 wide 2.8 on the second. Um I would jump on the 15 mil. I certain I like wide. Um where I lack though is is on the long end, but I'm not sure I want to carry them around. Um, there is an amazing 200 to 400 mil lens made by Canon with a built-in 1.5 teleconverter, and it, I think it weighs in at a hefty $12,000. Oh, so if anybody wants to buy me that, feel free to you know send me a gift. What about the di diopter on the focus problem? Ah, you know, know what? That, that is means. a very good question. Um, can you guys see me on here? If, if you can't see me, make me bigger and make the screen smaller. You can change the size. There's a little thing right next to your eyepiece that goes up and down. And when you look through it, it actually changes the focus in your um, viewfinder of your camera. It doesn't change the picture or the focus of the lens. But if you look through there and everything looks blurry, by all means, rotate it until everything looks sharp. Um, it also is for people that if you have glasses, you can adjust it so that you can shoot without your glasses on. Oh, I just learned something. Um... <laughs> Taking a photo of a flower is nice um, to take. I, I'm sorry. I uh, okay, I'll just read it. Taking the photo of a flower, is it nice to take a DOF that covers the whole flower or stacking pictures with a smaller depth of field focusing at a part at a time? Again, I think that to comes down to personal taste. You know, yeah. um, a lot of macro photographers, uh, I have an interview with Don Komarichka on the site as well. Uh, don't ask me to spell his name. Um, he's a friend of mine in Ontario, and he does a lot of macro, and he teaches this stuff, and he does the focus stacking. And his pictures are absolutely amazing, absolutely amazing. Because when you come in to do macro, which is not my specialty, um, your depth of field becomes like a millimeter. It's tiny, tiny, tiny. Um, so even if you're doing a flower, you're not even going to get part of the flower in focus. So a lot of times, focus stacking is the only way to go. Um, I would say, though, if you're just beginning and that's not something you want to want to give a go or you want to take a stab at at this point, don't worry about it. Um, Baby steps. Lots of Lots and lots of thank yous here. People giving a lot of feedback about how great this has been and helpful. Awesome. Um, just Thanks, trying to, guys. Trying to, I'm trying to filter the questions between those. I honestly think that's about it, really. Um, if I've missed anything, just, here's your chance to put in the last couple of questions. I've been, I've been trying to scan a whole bunch of, uh, whole bunch of questions and feedback, and I'm not getting any new questions. Just more awesome. thank yous. Oh, hyperfocal distance. Oh boy, Whew. Um, it's a little bit of a tricky subject because it's hard to do with today's lenses. Um, most of them aren't marked with a hyperfocal distance anymore. Um, they're only you only see them on a fixed focal length lens. Um, very tricky to calculate. But if you if you Google hyperfocal distance calculator, there are tools available that will help you calculate it. For those that aren't familiar with what that is. A hyperfocal distance is the optimal distance for where you want to focus to get the most focus in your scene. Um, so it's not necessarily on your subject. It's probably somewhere in front of it, okay? Because your focus happens a third in front of where you focus and two thirds behind. So if you focus on your subject and you want to maximize that hyperfocal distance, you're missing out on the front third, okay? So there are devices that will help you calculate distance. Um, tricky to use in the field, though. Great, got like three more questions here. Oh, they're okay. coming in. Um, All right, so we'll take these three and then we will call it a night. 
there's some equipment for sale. Um, <laughs> is it a, is it the 200 to 400? <laughs> no. Um, what do you recommend for working with flash modifiers? Modifiers, um, definitely not a puffer. Um, the little puffer things, the little plastic things that go on top do not change the shape or size of your light. So I use umbrellas, um, either a bounce umbrella or a shoot through umbrella. Uh, you want, depending on, you know, how much space you have or whether you're traveling with it, 32 inch, 42 inch, 52 inch. Um, I use a reflector, 42 or 52 inch, and I will bounce my flash into it or through it. Okay, what's a good ND filter for the first time buy? Um, I actually put recommendations on the waterfall post. So if you can find the waterfall right. post, um, there's some recommendations down the bottom. Um, I have the ProMaster brand, works fine for me, and it's variable and it's less expensive than some of the others. Um, I did find that I got a slight color shift towards the very top end of the filter, not something I couldn't correct out though. And Terry, that uh, waterfall uh, post is on the front page of dark site yeah it's Dark. in the little it's in the rotating banner yeah uh, do you use lens babies which is i do not go to um sorry what was the second part of that well it's do you use lens do you use lens baby lenses which is your most go-to I, I do not um i i've played with them and they're kind of fun but um, for me, I don't have a lot of application for them. I think if I was doing uh, weddings or fashion or something, maybe I would. But I find that, like a lot of things, to me, it's it's another toy and it's another gimmick that you can also do with um, a stuff in post-processing. So you can replicate a similar look in post-processing and have more control. Um, a lens baby is also sort of a cheaper version or a poor man's version of a tilt shift lens. So if you covet a tilt shift lens, then the lens baby might be a good option for you. But I personally don't have them. Does a UV filter really help and does price matter? Yes and yes. Uh, again, this is personal preference. Um, I have several photographers that will disagree with me and say that the UV filter is going to deteriorate your image quality and blah, blah, blah. Um, I, I say, pish tosh, that uh, I've, I have crashed lenses and broken the filter and saved my lens, which was $2,600, whereas if I dropped it without the filter, I probably would have broken the lens. Um, so I'd rather spend $100 on a filter than $2,600 on a lens or an insurance claim. Um, yes, quality matters and price matters. Don't get the cheapest one. You probably don't need the most expensive one, but the difference is going to be in lens coatings, and the cheaper lens coatings will smear and have a harder time cleaning them. Um, somebody wants to know when we're coming to India. No, <laughs> say we're, we're trying to get to some continents. Send us uh, your address. We'll be right there. <laughs> We're trying to get to some continents first, and then we're going to go back to other countries after that. Um, one more, two more questions. Uh, based on today's seminar, can we say that your best composition is simplicity? That's a good, that yes. I'm just going to leave it at that because it's simple. So is getting in closer. I mean, you say that all the time. You say this getting in closer is so much that I tell people get in closer. Yep, absolutely. Okay. Um, and I think there's one more. I find that a lot of beginners, um, and people new to photography tend to try and put too much in the picture. So simplification is almost never a bad thing. Well, I think that's it, Dar. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you everybody for attending. Um, I'm going to do it again uh, next week with a whole other group and you're, you're my inaugural group. So thank you for sticking it out and you guys are amazing. Thank you so much. And we'll see you on the website. Take care.